job with you. Two. I've had various different jobs with you two. Um, you know, and, and early on for the first three albums, I was the, you know, pretty much the sole producer. And it was, uh, and yeah, it was, I was the experienced one. So I was the guy who, who thought, okay, those drums have to be out in the hallway. And, you know, I, I, they didn't, they'd never been in, you know, in recording studios, no one, they didn't hardly had ever been in a record store. You know, I mean, they didn't, hadn't listened to many records. They only had like, you know, maybe television's first album, uh, and, and Iggy Pop out. That was n not many albums right. had got over to Ireland. So in those days, you know, the innocence of, of artists, artists aren't innocent so much anymore. But right. That's a whole other concept, you know, story about, you know, so we, um, so, so yeah, I went and did their first album that, that went pretty well. And, and actually in those days I had this, 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 um, I'm glad it, it didn't work out, but I had this, this idea that because I could work with lots of different bands, a producer, they should be able to work with lots of different producers. So for the second U2 album, I, I said, no, 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 you, sh and they went, really, we really enjoyed it. I was like, okay, I'll make, an exception. I'll do a second album. But really, I, I mean, I was always saying, well, why? I can work with lots of different bands. You should work with different producers. There's enough great music for all of us. Little did I know 40 years later, Andrew Sheps, <laughs> I'm telling you. But um, so anyway, second U2 album called October didn't do so well. You know, it's well documented that Bono um, had lost his lyrics. But I don't know if they would ever have been the lyrics, but they didn't really have much. And, and they were playing catch up. You know, it's, we all know the story. You've got your lifetime, you've got a long time to do your first album. Yep. You've got six, six weeks to write your second album. So second album didn't do so well. And, um, and it was then I said, look, you should go and work with, with, with some other people. And they said, yes, Steve, you're right. They went and did some recording with Sandy Perlman. Um, and a couple of other people, I think. And, and it got to a point where they, I got a phone call saying, Steve, what are you doing in September? I go, nothing. And they said, do you want to come and do our next album? And, and I thought, I, I, I want to get a hit with this band. I right. knew that it was there. I knew that they had it. It's just, it needed to be done, you know? And I said, okay. So it was, um, so the war album was the third album that, uh, that you know, had, uh, Sunday, Bloody Sunday, and New Year's Day, and um, and it was after that album I said, "Okay, now that's I've done I've done what's needed." Right. So that was my my first job with you two was was the producer and, and very much molder of their of their sound. You know, I mean between me and Edge, really. I mean Edge was always you know his. It's like you know people say how do you get that guitar sound with you know with 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 big country or with you know or with u2 or anything like that? it's like well the guitarist gets the sound we just record it and and we balance it within the within the um the thing but but there's other things that you do definitely mold you know you you mold the reverbs on the voices and the psychedelicness of the mix and the and you know everything like that and the and the and the and the distancing of the drum sound and 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 all that you know and um so i was very much the in charge of the first three albums and then they did the unforgettable fire with with brian eno and uh, and danny yeah and um who are a great team because you know and 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 then and they had the hit with um, Pride in the Name of Love that was great. Yeah. And I, I'd sort of lost contact with them. And, um, and then there was a big, like probably a year quiet. What are you two doing? No one really knew until I got a phone call just before Christmas saying, uh, Steve, um, we've, um, what are you doing in, <laughs> uh, in January? <laughs> I went, well, <laughs> nothing. You know, because that's one thing that I've always in my career, I've, I've never booked myself up album back to back to back to back because you never know what might come up right because you know a lot of produce you know 
I, I'm talking back in the day when bands had budgets and, you know, and, they, and, and the A&R man goes, who's on your list of producers? And they'd have six guys' names. Now, of those six, two of them don't want to do it. Two of them say, yes, I can do it next year, right. next March. And me going, I'll do it. I'm there. I'm ready. Right. You know, so I would, <laughs> because I never back my, I never, you know, I didn't want to go. I would do back to back records, but I never liked to have all that long list, you know. Right, right. Because that makes it a job almost. It makes it a job. It's, it's, and, and also you miss out on the great ones, you know. So, so anyway, I, I, I went over to Dublin and, and, and basically what Paul McGuinness is, had said to them, he'd sat down with the band and said, look, you've, you've been a year or more on this album and, um, and you don't, and it, it, it's not really finished, is it guys? And you know, you're a big band, but we need to get on the road because we're paying salaries to all this crew and all this, you know, how, and he was very black and white. He said, look, when you work with Steve, you did the first album in two months, second album, and you never spent more than three months on an album. Um, why don't you get Steve in to come and help you finish it off? So, so my job then sort of became like a red Adair, <laughs> you know, like coming in to, 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 to save the day or something right. like that. He wasn't really that, but it, it says mixed by, but that indicates a, 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 a sense of the mix being the last thing that's done right the finishing and with you two sometimes the writing is the last thing that's done yeah. and the mix is the first thing that's done i mean it's 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 a it's i've never known such a crazy recording process as as the evolve evolving world of you two um and uh and it and it really is the most crazy the most I mean, as 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 together as they are in their in their business world and their and their stage production and everything, they have to have chaos in the studio. You know, um, <laughs> the roadies were telling me when they worked with Rick Rick Rubin and um, and Rick Rick's people came in with tape measures. There was this like, what's all this about? You know. <laughs> well, see, now I actually worked on those sessions and we did not bring any tape measures, but I wonder what that was about. You didn't? Okay. Well, maybe it was Sammy being a little bit. Yeah, you know, I don't know. No, it was. Um, it was. Yeah, it was interesting. It was definitely <laughs> a what the hell is going on from all sides on that. But I mean, yes. it was the sort of chaos where the song basically is done, and then, right. and I think it was Adam who said, "Hey, I want to try a, a bass overdub on the bridge of the song," and so right. he does one take, and then you look down, and the whole band is playing. You're like, oh. And so you're punching the entire band on the bridge of a song that's finished. Yeah. And oh, then yeah, yeah, somehow yeah. that's all got to work. And, and that was like, it's that 15 hours a day. And then they go home and no, then you figure and, out what you've got. Now imagine when the song's not finished yeah. and they're still doing that. I mean, it's just, um, it, it, it's wonderful. And it, it's, you know, when I look back on those, 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 those albums with you two, I, it's a bit like, a, you know, when people talk about the war, you know, like soldiers say, best years of my life was, <laughs> of course they weren't. But you look through rose colored glasses because they were so horrendous. You sort of, because you got through them. Right. And maybe we won the war. We look at it. But at the time, we didn't know we'd won the war. You know, certainly on some albums, we did win the war. You know, the, the, the. The, the luck's run out a little bit with them, but um, it, the luck will run out with everybody. So when you came in on the later records and you yeah. saw, I mean, because obviously there's a gigantic amount of chaos because they've had a year and a half to create the chaos and it's yeah. not done. Did you ever get the sense of, thank God I missed that year and a half and what a great position to come in with all this raw material and do that? Or did you kind yeah. of miss the oh, fact that you, I, we would get to create it along the way? Well... No, no, I, I, look, during that year and a half of craziness, it would, especially in the later years, it, 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 it would become private jets and let's go to Morocco. And, you know, I mean, it was just, it was Elvis at its most 
pompous in a way, you know, you know what I mean? And I don't yeah. mean that badly. I, you know, it's, it was just the sense of the ridiculous. And that's Irish for you. The Irish have this wonderful <laughs> sense of the ridiculous and I love them for it. So I, I missed the, you know, two weeks on Edge's yacht doing overdubs. Right. Nothing was used, you know, but two weeks on a yacht, not fucking bad. Right. You know, so I, I did miss all that. But the reason they asked me always to come back is that, you know, that that thing that if Steve, uh, uh, if Bill Gates went back to his high school reunion, the guy who is now a dustman, but during high school, he was the Jack the Lad everyone would revert. Bill Gates would revert to the little nerdy guy. Yeah. You know, yeah. because when you're, and, and that's what it was like when you two see me in a recording studio. It's like, oh my God, Steve's here. We better start working now. <laughs> I know. love that Brian and Danny aren't the grown-ups, but you are. Like <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, exactly. And, uh...